want to ask you to take a couple of minutes and look at this photograph. I'm going to give you a bit of background on the photograph and then ask you just to make a few notes about what you see. I took this photograph in Shiraz, Iran, and Shiraz is sort of a university town. It's in sort of South Central Iran. This is the Nasir al Malik Mosque, and it was a very important to focus on the fact that it was a family mosque. You think about mid the Middle Ages, medieval period in Europe, if you had a very wealthy family, that family might easily have had a family chapel. This is exactly the same idea, but this is a mosque. And interesting, when you approach this building from the outside, it's not immediately obvious that it is a mosque. There's no minaret, for example, because there's no reason for a call to prayer, which is the major architectural feature that would allow the call to prayer to be heard by a lot of different people. Do we have to have those? I just wanted to fix the camera because people can okay. see. Right. Now we're good. Great, okay. It was built in the late 19th century. There might be some features that you would automatically notice. One of which is the so-called Persian arch. So if we're thinking about architectural features, if we're thinking about clues that those features might give us, that's one place to start with this particular mosque. You might also notice the mosaic, the stone mosaic features that are part of this building. Possible. If you were able to put yourself into the photo, into the mosque, might be struck by the carpets. Would you could take your shoes off and walk on the carpets? Maybe you'd like to run your hands on the ribbed columns so that you could feel what they were like. If you focus on the Persian arches, come back to those, right? Notice that they can guide you further and further into the photo because of the way you would consider walking further and further into the building. You've already noticed there's somebody here, there's somebody standing here. There he is. When I encountered him, when I took this shot, he was praying. It's not about the gracefulness of the shot. Some of them are pretty good, some of them look kind of boring, and we'll see later on. It's what you do with it. It's how you engage it. Remember, we're only going to talk about one thing this entire time, and that's engagement. So take a couple minutes and give yourself the time, perhaps, to ask some, some additional questions about this photo. I'll let you do that. We're going to keep accumulating some of those questions as we go forward. We're going to have some conversation. When you get to your own assignment in a bit, that will give us a chance to bring some of it all together. I'll give you the chance to do a little bit of that writing right now.
All right, we're going to move on. So I, how do I do this? So I, okay, whoops, there we go. All right. This is an embarrassing admission, but here goes anyway. When I was growing up, which was in the 50s, I went to Catholic school and we were doing global education. Really different than what we're doing right now. I'm sure we're doing all the time. We were given these maps. I remember distinctly having a map of Latin America. You know where it was. Grew up in the Midwest, Kansas City. Had no clue where that was. And my goal, my assignment was to be sure that I could have brought it for each of the countries, or many of the countries in this place called Latin America. So I went to the pharmacy, to a drugstore with my mom, and we got plain capsules of pills, but you take the pill part out and it's just the little gelatin thing. Okay, so the idea was I would take some grains of coffee or wheat or I don't know, some such thing, and then I would put it into these little capsules and glue it onto the map. Global education, okay? That's what I knew about global education. Well, I've come a long way, so I don't do that anymore. But let's talk about, in a very serious way, where global education used to be. Not in the 50s when I was growing up. But let's go back to, let's say the 1980s. Starting in the 1980s, there was a, in the US, there was a far more comprehensive, far more stirring conversation starting up about what global education really was. And there were new dimensions of global education that were starting to develop. People were absolutely starting to talk about cross-cultural awareness. Believe it or not, that was new in the 1980s. Knowing global dynamics, which we'll come back to, new in the 1980s. Awareness of human choices, new in the 1980s as a discipline, as something that people would study. Planet awareness, state of the planet, pretty new in the 1980s. By 1982, 1983, there was an even stronger discussion about the fact that American education should indeed be globalized. That conversation was really starting in the mid-1980s. But between 2000 and 2016 or so, something else happened in a far more comprehensive way, and that's where you come in. There was an absolute discussion about curriculum and the fact that curricula should be globalized, whatever that meant. Big point, back to our idea of engagement, that it was clear that American educators and European educators and educators all over the globe were starting to think about education in different ways. And that's what you're doing exactly right now. <coughs> You're probably aware of Model UN. Some of you did Model UN when you were in high school. Some of you are continuing to do Model UN at the collegiate level. That's global education. You might not assume that there is a curricular background to some of that, but in fact there is. And we're going to get, we will get further into that as we go forward. Let's see, let's go ahead and open up this 
link and oh wait okay is it coming up okay I'll give you a couple of tips as you go forward global education is not only some of the most exciting stuff you could be doing but it's also the most daunting and we're going to talk about that sense of being, well, frankly, intimidated by the whole idea of global education. Because, well, it's big. My suggestion for you is to get a fix on one region of the world you're particularly interested in. Mine happens to be the Middle East. A little bit of territory. You could also focus on certain websites. I'm going to introduce to this maybe next question or maybe have something. But I'm going to introduce you to some of the websites that you may just want to watch. Not even around your hip pocket so that you are always sort of updating doesn't want to go there. Might not, yeah. That's all right. it's not uh, Don't worry oh, about it. There, there, we there we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. Project Zero. Project Zero is 50 years old. And what it is doing now more than even it was before is to help you understand what some of the resources might be that are available to you. Some of them are books, of course. Some of them oops, are different projects. The Project Zero, what Harvard's doing there is giving you kind of a one-stop shop for meeting your interest in some aspects of global education. Something like this, cultures of thinking, brand new. Even though Project Zero has been, has, been a, sorry, has been in business for the past 50 years, it's continually adding more and more opportunities for you to explore on your own. And Hayden said he was going to share with you these, these slides so you can do that. So you have these and only take notes as you wish, but understanding you're going to get these slides. You're going to have all the links and kind of all of that. As you move further into your education to become teachers, to come to go back in the classroom, some of you are in the classroom right now and you're thinking, Holy moly, I'm just trying to figure out what the second grade is going to be doing on Monday. I don't, I can't really focus on any of this stuff. That's okay. But at some point, you're going to want to be able to combine your thinking as with respect to what's out there in terms of the field. Project Zero is a great way to, to do that. All right, let's go back to the slide, which is. I just want to, yes, there we go. Okay. Maybe I won't do too much more. Okay. If you're interested in what the UN, the United Nations, offers in the way of global education, this is a really great site. I'm not going to open it up now to take time. The UNA, USA, there's a chapter here in Philadelphia. The, if you click on the UN.org website, you're going to automatically find the, the menu for Cyber School Bus, which is a very, not new, but a very important set of resources for teachers. And we're going to come back a little bit later on to talk about human rights. Because as you think about global education, sooner or later, one of your immediate concerns will be human rights what's going on in the world in terms of the history of human rights, 
how they change, how we focus on them change, and as you think about what you, what UNA USA offers as an organization, but also what the UN offers, that will take you right back to be considering rights. Mm -hmm. Best practices. That's a phrase that is getting a lot of publicity right now. One of the interesting things about global education is as it's evolved, best practices, how to consider others' rights, how to consider variety of menu for, for learning, students in the classroom choosing what they might be interested in, all of that is considered best practices now. Interestingly, as global education has started to gain a lot more momentum, it's merging with the idea of best practice. And you'll see that depending on which global education documents you find yourself interested in. Here's another link that you'll have with your slide, Project 21. Project 21 focuses primarily on the melding of standards with curricula. There are about 30, between 20 and 30 states across the US that are, that have now accepted some of the Project 21 standards. So, uh, sorry, Pennsylvania is not one of them, New Jersey is. So that, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you look on this website and you, if you're interested in fifth grade or you're interested in middle school moving into grade six or eight, then you'll find standards that are describing cer certain global education initiatives and indicators. And again, New Jersey is one state that, that does that. I do want to show you this website, which I think I already opened up. Shared Studios, that's the portal project. Yeah. This is the extreme. This is some, some of the most spectacular global education energy I have ever seen. The idea is very simple, but and I saw it in operation at a conference a couple of years ago and was just undone by it. Anyway, this is how it works. If you have enough money in your school district or in a particular department, then you can actually sign up to have one of these portals delivered to your school site, for example, and then you could connect with Cairo. Mm real time so that students, teachers, community members would have the opportunity to act to literally go into this big um, small building for a container and then have, have a camera that was live in somewhere in Cairo perhaps it only had another school. It's, it's the ultimate um, best practices, but it means, of course, you have to have a lot of money to, to be doing that. Not everybody can do it. So you're back to figuring out what can you do with stuff that is right in front of you. So remember, it's all about engagement. This is where we're going to be going in a little bit. All right. So we're going to be getting rid of this and then go back. Slides. Great, thanks, Alex. Yep. Okay. I'm gonna let you look at that photo for a couple of minutes. That's Persepolis. But I want you to describe a little bit about what you're actually seeing in that photograph, being this one. So what do you see there? Becky, what do you see there? Uh, I think 
Yeah. All right, she sees the people, she sees the stone. Otto, what do you see? I see the same thing, it looks old. Uh, yeah, it's little, yep. Uh -huh. We focus on the age, focus on the same architectural features that Becky saw. Anything else? I don't see your name. Right, nice. Okay, anything else? Heather? Yeah, it almost looks like there's like a cobblestone, like there's like a half next to it, so it almost like there's like a right here. Yeah, like yeah, it looks like it's like meant to be like looked at. Right. It's like almost being preserved. Okay, there we go. All right, so this is, this is Persepolis again. Talk a little bit about what Persepolis is, what it was, and then Persepolis, obviously, here's the run. Persepolis is right about there. And I took this shot, I was there in 2013. It was originally constructed 500 before the Common Era. It was one of the ancient Persian kingdoms. It was not a city, but it was a governmental center. Cyrus the Great, so on. Those individuals would bring all areas of the kingdom together. It was in March, which was the Persian New Year, still celebrated actually as, as the New Year. And so people would come together probably year after year and experience what it was like to be with each other and then pay taxes. It was really all about the money then, all about the money now. There are thousands of pictures of Persepolis. There's not much way to take a new picture of Persepolis that shows some special feature. So all I did was to take it sideways. Commented on the relief. So which those stone figures that are coming off the, off the stone, it's a, they're guards. And you may have noticed, may have realized that they're holding spears and their muscles are very distinctively shown and it goes back a ways. Somebody else commented on the fact that it's a walkway. Here's the it's a really sunny, hot day. So you can see that in the background as well. Point is, again, not much way of taking a new shot of Persepolis, but how to engage yourself in it. That's the point. Remember, we're just talking about one thing, and that's engagement, and that's what you're going to be doing with your photographs in a little bit. A couple of minutes ago, I noted that to be thinking about global education, to be thinking about teaching in general is darn right scary on most days. And yet, it's your job to overcome that kind of natural hesitancy. In global education, there's a whole lot to be hesitant about. That's where you can match up your own hesitancy with your students as well. Figuring out ways to enable your students to gain some energy, to gain some strength in their own footing as they move into class, classroom setting, setting more generally, or as they move into thinking about what they're going to do with this information all sort of bundled together with some of the new 21st century learning and 21st century skills that are more and more common. Challenges and benefits, it's, they're the same in global education. Achieving some depth, you can do that if you think about maybe one or two regions only. But achieve, sorry, achieving depth is also a challenge because that's hard to do. Keeping up with new sources, there's no textbook. 
for global education. There are some, but they're so bad. <laughs> I mean no disrespect, but they're like really boring. So what, so what do you do instead? Well, you read, and the slides give you all the websites, the links that you might want to use. We're going to find more ways of doing that in a little bit. Moving us all away from bias. A part of my heritage is Cuban, and so I'm sort of used to a lot of, well, criticisms, crazy statements about what Cubans are really like. And I've always had sort of a sensitivity about that, which I've used to great advantage, and that's moving myself and others away from, from bias and what humans are really like. My second favorite area of the world is the Middle East, and moving myself and others away from that bias against the Middle East, what the Middle East is really like, and sort of all those descriptors that you know all too well, that's important in all but that's also part of best practices, approaching some of the work that you do with a kind of neutrality and a kind of strength. All right, this is another one of those really, really, really boring shots. Except that it isn't. This is a picture of the editor one of the 23 plus dams in the so-called Ataturk Dam Project, which is in southeastern Turkey. And when I took this shot, I was really fascinated by what differences there were between this very, very dry landscape and the water. I was really interested in the way the dams sort of came together. But some of my fascination was a little bit uncertain. If you know anything about the geography of the Middle East, you know that both the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers flow not only from Turkey, but then they flow into Iraq and to Syria. So if you think about water politics, and what Turkey is doing right now, literally right now, with respect to water use, with respect to damming up portions of the Euphrates River in particular, what that means for the populations downstream. All of a sudden, this really boring photo of a dam takes on a whole new meaning. ISIS, or Islamic State, as it's now more familiarly called, has done the same thing. Has dammed up portions of the Euphrates River in order to make the, some of the populations in Iraq suffer more fully. Again, just a dam, just a photograph, not so interesting, until you look behind what might be in the relationship among the countries that have been that, have, that partake in that in those waterways let's get to that water conflict map This is an interactive map. It's one of the cooler maps you're going to find. And you want to write down the URL because I don't think that's in the slides. But this is a water conflict map made by the Pacific Institute. And if you, you could go, you could use it through time, starts way up here at 3000 BC. And then if you scroll down, let's get to 1776 which is right, there we go, there. You may not be aware of this, but the British used poison in the New York waterway. <coughs> Probably remember that the British occupied the city of New York for the entire American Revolution. 
what they also poison the water sources to use to make a stronger case for their domination of the city of New York. But when you're thinking about water as a major issue around the world, even more than oil, when you're thinking about the Middle East, actually, all of a sudden, the conflict over natural resources takes you not only into the future, but it also takes you into the past. And this water conflict map is a great way to be thinking, to be thinking about how water has been used around the world through time, the way these, these little balloons open up, so you can click on one, open it up, and get more information. Your students can do that too. You can begin to enable them to be thinking about how they might use such a map. But again, remember we, st oh, I'm flipping over here, right? It started, it started just with thinking about that Ataturk Dam in southeastern Turkey near Gaziantep. going to move us into slides. Let's There's some really tricky phrasing in this sentence. Global competency, capacity, and disposition. Capacity meaning the ability, disposition meaning the inclination to understand and to act. Barely below the surface with respect to global education is the idea that, that your, the kids in front of you, excuse me, your students, would be turned into activists. That's perhaps very objectionable, not necessarily a completely accepted plan. It's one thing to understand it's something else, absolutely something else, to imagine that those young people are going to be activists. I'm gonna let that just sit in the air for the time being. One thing to understand, something different to actually want to be an activist. And I'm not, there's no right answer. That's just out there as something that's embedded. It's maybe not embedded in teaching French. Maybe not in teaching math. But it's absolutely there when you're thinking about social studies and particular global education. All right. World heritage. And all the work that I'm doing now basically is on world heritage. And I also just finished a year of writing historical blogs for the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. You can get on that website, hsp.org, in case you're interested in finding my blog. There's going to be a teacher workshop in April at the Historical Society based on those blogs. We're going to print them out with all the documents out that I use to write those blogs. But and in being trained as an historian as a basically play old history teacher at the high school level, my first inclination is always to go for history. Ooh. Absolutely history. right. <laughs> yep, yeah, right. But how to do that, how to draw some lines around exactly how you manage to dive, swallow and digest all of that history, really, really hard to do. Another suggestion is to focus on world heritage. As you think about world heritage, you have the sites, independent hall, and you have cities. Independent hall, of course, is one of several world heritage sites in Philadelphia, one of 
many, many World Heritage Sites in the U.S. and one of thousands of World Heritage Sites around the world, Great Wall of China, Taj Mahal, so on. World Heritage Cities is a very different matter. Philadelphia is now a World Heritage City, has been since 2015. That designation means that we have sort of a cultural sibling relationship with Havana, Cuba, and Buenos de Cuba, and other areas in Latin America and the Caribbean, other areas in the world, Cairo, for example. So if you're thinking, well, maybe I could just make a slice through some of this material some of these opportunities. You could do that pretty easily. These are two great websites. This is a World Heritage, sorry, a World Heritage website that had or part of UNESCO's broader organization. I won't click on the website, but these are live links, and you can do that when you have when you have the slide. But the reading level for the, for the information about the World Heritage Sites is really very good. And if you're depending on the reading level of your students, you could assign portions of these. There's live video feed, Great Wall of China. You can pull it up and actually be panning the Great Wall of China. YouTube does a really excellent job as well. So these are two. This is for World Heritage Cities. This one is far more limited, but gives you a nice place to start. But if you're thinking about, well, how am I going to find information about these, about the sites and the cities, <clears throat> these are the best places to start. But also YouTube, Rick Skies, if you know who that individual is, there are lots and lots of ways of doing that. To imagine that World Heritage Education can make a difference in the way you and your young people encounter the world sounds like a pretty tall order, and yet the more you think about the benefits, how those young people, the kids right in front of you, can get some new attitudes about how they take in the world, and how, frankly, how you take in the world can make a considerable difference as well. If you take yourself back to the United Nations and what the UN offers to us right now, one place you might end up are the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And for World Heritage Cities, it has a pretty special significance because one of the SDGs' target is to make cities stronger, make cities more sustainable, and young people knowing what that, the variety of heritage, heritages that there are in their city, in their own home city, can make some difference as well. I'm going to roll through these a little bit faster so we have more time. If you like to travel very much, very frequently, Lonely Planet declared Philadelphia as the best city in the U.S to travel in over the past year. That might come as a bit of a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a great city, but wow, really? Okay, we got the Super Bowl, but that's <laughs> Obviously, that's fairly recent. And believe me, the Super Bowl put places, people in the world in a far different relationship to Philadelphia than they ever had been. But if you imagine what the history of Philadelphia is, the variety of world heritages, plural, that are now part of the fabric, the social landscape of our, of our city, then you have a little bit of leg up on understanding the variety of dimensions that there are, the reasons for you to study the city. San Antonio, Texas is the only other World Heritage City in the U.S. And that's a very recent designation within the past 
six months. Going to move more fully into some of the World Heritage programming that is now part of what is happening right now. When Global Philadelphia Association started in 2010, years before Philadelphia became a World Heritage City, there was a lot of interest in the possibility that maybe education would somehow be part of what the city might want to do and might want to engage in. Over here, before you go, I'm hoping that you will take some of these bookmarks, some of you will take a look at the new World Heritage Coloring Book, which is pretty cool, actually. And this sheet, you really want to be sure you get this sheet, which gives you a lot of nice links, and as a, someone who's going to be coming, coming a teacher, you want to be sure you have your hands on as many sources as you possibly can digest, particularly those that are lessons, lessons and units, and the links that are on that sheet, but also you can get to through the globalphiladelphia.org website. That will give you quite a bit of range of information. But over the past three years in particular, there has been more and more, more, and more programming development that has been developing. World Heritage Day is now celebrated every spring in the city of Philadelphia. This was taken in, at one of the last World Heritage Day celebrations. And I think this was at Andrew Jackson Elementary. And the, the children were experiencing a variety of performers, all sorts of presentations. Their teachers were having a professional development day as part of what was happening with the celebration of World Heritage Day. This is the theme, educating global kids with roots, meaning <clears throat> enabling young people here in Philadelphia to become more globally minded, back to this idea of global education having come really, really far, and yet, that anticipation that maybe they would better understand and in fact better appreciate the city that they lived in. Keep in mind that as you're focused on cities like Philadelphia in particular, you are looking at heritages plural. All of us have all sorts of heritages in our background and we may think that maybe they don't, maybe they're not brought up to the surface, quite as frequently as we would like. With something like <coughs> celebrating World Heritage generally, that is a whole different, really a whole different idea. Okay. The World Heritage Resource Center is a brand new website, still under construction. We're just about done with it now. We got, a, we got support from a web developer who is developing this for us for free and we're going to be launching it probably within the next month. And to find it, you go on the global philadelphia.org website and you can pull it right up. This is a film that I'm not going to focus on for too long, but over here there's a postcard that gives you information about the film a couple of years ago. It's available in 10 different languages, so depending on the language availability of your students, you might be able to, they might be able to see it, to listen to it in their own language. All right, now I'm going to move into a more direct focus on an event that happened over the summer. So it's not quite, it's about 10 or 12. It's no rush. All right, yeah. so we're going to break in about five, six minutes, move into this discussion with your partners, and then we'll wrap up after that. But first I want to talk about this. The ultimate road trip. <laughs> 
This past summer, I had the chance to go to India and Nepal with a group of other teachers, and I was the academic coach on the trip, and basically my job was to assist teachers as we were walking along in any of the sites that we went to, to enable them to keep thinking about how exactly they might use the site that they were visiting. So we were, we went from the 29th of July through August 17th. We were focused on a lot of other world heritage sites and cities in India and Nepal. We worked with geo.org and they kind of rearranged a little bit one of their regular trips for teachers to India and Nepal and added a few more world heritage sites for our benefit. We wanted to be sure that teachers had the chance to create and then to use lesson plans that they created. There were cross disciplines, social studies, music, math, all of that, and to help Philadelphia to become more global citizen, and also to see Philadelphia partners working together. We had a little bit of support from the University of Pennsylvania South Asia Center, and we had support from a little bit of support from Global Philadelphia more generally. So we had a lot of different partners who were working together. In 2005, Nepal, particularly the area right around Kathmandu, suffered a very, very devastating earthquake. And this is a picture the shot I took of, again, was this past summer, still doing a lot of reconstruction of local sites and local areas right around Kathmandu. But this is the reconstruction of a World Heritage Site. But the World Heritage Sites are getting a lot of attention and do all the time from both publicity purposes because of people visiting World Heritage Sites, but in the sense of the reconstruction of a site, it's an important point that they are absolutely living sites. This is the, this is Varanasi, this is on the Ganges River, another a very, very important World Heritage Site. This is at night, obviously, and we were in a boat right, right on the shoreline. <coughs> This is another, this is back to Nepal, this is back in Kathmandu, it's a very interesting space. This is a cloistered space and the living goddess who is important in Buddhism as well as in Hinduism, as well as in Nepali tradition. She's a young girl, she lives in this cloistered space and visitors come to see her, but you could imagine what it would be like to engage your young people in the idea of being a living goddess, what the expectations are for your family, what happens when you're done, when you've aged out of being a living goddess. So there's lots and lots of opportunity for conversation about such individuals and traditions. One of the other things I'm doing in retirement is writing for SABA, the South Asia Book Award Committee. It's a national book award, and I help with a, an e-committee, help to evaluate different books. And this particular image shows us at the Jitwan National Park, which is in Nepal, right near the border between Nepal and India. In fact, this national park, part of it is actually in India and part of it is in Nepal. One of the books that we gave an award to is, is entitled What Elephants Know, written by Eric Dinnerstein. And the book was actually situated in, the, in what was the Royal Chitwan, Royal Chitwan Park, which is now the Chitwan National Park. And so I wrote to Disney, wrote to the publisher, and asked the publisher if they would give us copies of the books, for, copies of the book for all of the participants. And they said, sure. So I said, well, we, we'll do a selfie. We'll take a <laughs> photo shot when, when, for you, for the publisher, once we get to the park. And there we go. This is us back in India learning about 
learning about chai from a chai seller in a bazaar area in the Canary Bazaar area, right in a portion of Old Delhi. Ooh. There are so many different ways of engaging your young people in global opportunities, not the least of which is food. Don't rush by that because you don't think it's very serious. Absolutely, lots and lots of opportunity. Taj Mahal, of course, and sort of like taking a shot of Persepolis, not many new shots to be taken of the Taj Mahal. So I didn't take a new shot of the entire building. This I took, but only because I wanted it as a reminder. And what I wanted to be reminded about was all the people who I saw interacting there. It was a World Heritage <coughs> site. I could focus on the history of site. It was built around the same time as Jamestown. Thinking early 1600s, Jamestown, Virginia, early to mid 1600s, Agra, India. There's always, there's always a way in to how you might use a shot, whether you took it or not. Nothing spectacular about this. What do I ask you to imagine using your theories? Pot was never pot when we were in Kathmandu, we had the chance to go to learn about something called the Sasani Project. S A S A N E. You can Google it for free. The Sasani Project enables traffic women to regain control over their lives. So the project rescues women who've been involved in sexual trafficking, and it teaches them how to be court reporters. So that a young woman who might escape from such a situation ends up in a police station in Kathmandu, they're expanding out to different cities in India, that she might have someone to talk to who had been through the same experience. When we were leaving the building where we had our dinner, <coughs> rather than turn right to go out the door, I just happened to look left. This is the shot that I saw. These are all the bowls and all the pots and pans that, were used, that we used when we were learning how to make momos, which is like uh, dumplings. But can you imagine what it would be like to hear the water in the sinks going to hear the women talk in the kitchen washing all of these, drying all of these. How you would engage yourself in the experience, maybe using your sense of hearing. Imagine what it was like to eat everything that we did. But you don't have to do it just the obvious way. Reach right into that photograph. Just like, oh, got a cord. that's right, I got it. Just like, that. What happens when you reach into that photo? Literally, 
what happens when you're reaching the that specific photo based on the bit that you know about it? All right, we're gonna stop there. You can turn the lights back on and you all have, you're in your teams, so you have your photo, you have an assignment, and we'll take about, so it's right afternoon, we're gonna take maybe 10 minutes or so for you to work with your partner on your photo. Did you get a photo? Yeah, we're. Oh, you're right too, all right. So what you wanna do is develop at least one or two more ideas for student engagement. Say you had the chance to write another paragraph, because these are really incomplete. What would you do? What would you put in the, in the additional photograph if you had the chance to add some more? How would you engage those young people in front of you? Okay, so you've got. 10 minutes, is that sure. plenty of time? Great, 10 minutes. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Taking the picture, <laughs> we are taking the picture and kind of explaining it further, and kind of like how can we engage with your kid, for example, with this photo. And so we're just kind of taking down um, ways, basically ways to engage. Uh, so this is kind of just one of the many photos uh, Sarah brought in, and um, some of the other photos are on the table, um, and I'll kind of pan around when we're done. So we can do the panning around. We're going to have yeah. time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To do that. Mm -hmm. So we can do that as part of the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Um, the laptop is about to die. So I'm going to get it charged up a couple more seconds. Okay. And then I'm just going to like. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Cool. Is it, is it good to be this color? Yeah. Okay. Are you done with the PowerPoint? Do you still need it? Okay. I just want to get them up, see if they have any questions. And then because they can. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to get this. Oh, we have a lot of questions. No, 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 no. Thanks. Um. All right, so then we have your chat up. So if you have ideas, you want to put them in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what? Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, you know why? Yeah. There we go. I'll move back a little more. Mm -hmm. So um, you can type your you can type your answer here. Um, so basically, what we're asking is, how would you engage students with this photo? Um, so you can type it in the chat, um, and then um, we'll kind of discuss as a group. You're also not yeah, it's, it's totally awesome. Yeah, we, we just wanted to show you what we were doing. Um, so we were talking about like the things. There's like three different colors going on in there. But like, what were you saying about that? Um, basically, like what, you know, and, you know, kids, what do they do to decorate their bike? Like, what are your ways to decorate your bike? Is it, maybe is it religious? Is it fun? Um, and then we also were thinking, um, what sort of games would you play? You know, what are, if you were with them, if you were with them like tag, how do you beat those kind of games? Or is there something different that in the chat, like, you know, the chaps, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, what was it? To their own lives. Oh, oh, I like that. I like that, Ashley. Yeah. That's actually that's actually good because then they can say, "Oh, you like doing this too? We do that too." Um, I think the thing was, do you have to wear a helmet too? Yeah. Yeah. There's no helmets here. There's no helmets, so I wonder if they have no safety. No Yeah. Also, like the age of the children too. Yeah, they're pretty young. Mm -hmm. And like, they like talk about their like, culture. Mm -hmm. We've got about four, four more minutes or so. Four more minutes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to face the camera down first this way. Okay. <laughs> so we can still see everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. A little bit more because my shoulder's in there. Just okay. There we go. Great. <laughs> Just like, I'm really just like a little bit of it. So I'll have for children. So I gotta be on my side. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, this is good to see though. I took the, um, the purple one. Raspberry? I think it's raspberry. Oh, it's on the uh, how do you that's Oh, that's perfect. That's great. Um, I wanted to. So you talk about like the landscape too, like the sidewalks. I mean, the, the sidewalks. So like. Most ends, if not large, they're not, not large enough for a bike to be played. You know, yeah. on a bike. So they're gonna have to be on this road. So like, is that like? Yeah. And look how big the bike is compared to that kid. Yeah. Clearly, it's not. It's, it's literally as tall as this child. Like you know, with the kid's bike, it's supposed to be up to their hip, right? This is up to their. Oh, well, yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Some presentation. So Becky and Jessica are going to be doing you're going to come on up. You're going to talk to us about your photograph and tell us what you were able to do. So we'll have the camera. It's facing this way. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. And then before we end, we'll pan the rest of the photographs. So that yeah, actually, I was thinking if you had all the groups come up and they, if you could just kind of just show your photo to the camera and then just stand back. Thank you. So this is one photo that we're going to be kind of discussing. Let it focus just a little bit. All right, you guys can go ahead and discuss with the group. All right, so we're going to learn from each of the groups. Remember, all we're talking about here is engagement. We started with the question mark of engagement. Now we're moving into the part where you're demonstrating how much you know about engagement. Take it away, Jessica and Becky. Suggested questions about them were 
After those already existing questions, we came up with um, our own questions to further engage the students. So we said, What everyday personal objects would you see in a museum in 2019? Personal to you. And um, also the feedback on the wrist, like what are color significance, the different sizes? Were they worn on the wrist, on the arm? What is that significance? What does that mean to them? Um, uh, <coughs> do you think that their wrist, do you think that these um, women or men? Um, think that these bracelets are a good representation of themselves. We mm -hmm. thought that. Um, and then, yeah, and then we came up with like an activity that they could do depending on the age of the student. You could either have them do a report and pick the object that they can see in the museum in South Sudan, or they can make the super charm bracelets and kind of have that here in different charms we give them to a lot of people. So they can create their own little charm bracelet out of material found in the classroom, and each charm represents something about themselves. That is cool. so cool. Thank Let's you. Going. Great. Um, go ahead. Um, a little closer and good right there and let it hold. It's probably blurry for them, but anyway. Okay. All right. You're good. <laughs> All right. So we have a picture of a little girl, and she's um, described as taking a break outside of the museum in um, Tehran, Iran. And um, depending on the learners, we sort of wanted to engage students by getting them to think, like, who is this little girl, um, and start thinking about common ground with her. Um, so one way we thought to do that was to do sort of a free write, um, maybe have students ask students to notice um, two or three um, things about the photo, um, about the student, or about the girl in particular, or about her environment, um, write them down on a post-it note, and then have sort of a splash of the post-it notes and then a share out. Um, another thing we thought of was, um, there's a, a portion of the paragraph that describes um, other other little girls who are viewed rollerblading in the park, and if this little girl would become preferred to have been in the park. Um, so starting to think about what girls in this part of the world like to do, or what children of this age like to do. Um, again, focusing on sort of um, similarities. Um, and I guess this could be differentiated by um, having the students draw a picture of their thoughts to represent, or or just sharing verbally. Um, they can work in partners where individuals can start and then um, share the prompts. Yeah, um, just like with the first activity where they would um, talk about the similarities, uh, depending on how they are, they can tell them certain things to notice. Um, if she has a uniform, you know, at your school, you know, that's something they have in common with her. So it could overall lead them to the idea that like people around the world could be similar to you um, just because of one way that you might have a similarity between the two of you. Um, and then when talking about uh, maybe interests, um, that that could be a part of what's similar to them too. Um, and then just depending on the brain, you can also just further lead into the fact that she has on a uniform. So that might mean that she's being education to uh, girls in the could open up a lot of conversation. We saw it as like a introductory kind of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. This is our picture. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Um, basically, an open air market with some watermelon and some potatoes and other produce. Um, so we came up with just some ideas of how you could get students engaged here. So the first was kind of having students like compare and contrast like the U.S. experience of going to get produce like this with like the Middle Eastern experience, um, like what it's like to be at an open air market versus what it's like to be at like a wake or a grocery store here. Um, and then we talked about like do these. One of the things this paragraph says is that um, where this is taken, like these vegetables and fruits um, appear in 
every meal, basically. So we said, like, we would ask students, do these kinds of things appear on your plate with every meal? Like, is that a common part of your diet, et cetera? And then kind of along the same lines, we talked about um, having students compare, like, the way the recipes would be different between, like, how we might use these fruits and vegetables versus um, how they might be used in different plates and dishes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And you guys have seen this one. What's <laughs> this? All right. Uh, we'll photo real quick. Uh, so our photo is uh, four kids in Turkey, and they're standing in the um, in the road with a bicycle, and we kind of wanted to highlight. The bicycle and obviously the kids in the photo. Um, so one of the things that in order to engage the kids would be to ask them simply, you know, what kind of games do you play? What you know, this is what I play. Like I play tag, you play tag, um, and then some of the other things that we thought about were specifically the bike um, and talking with the online people as well. Kind of, you know, what kind of bike is that? Do you uh, we notice that the bike is extremely high up on the kid. Like, do they all share the bike? Do they, um, you know? Family bike, that kind of thing, and then, um, like safety, like bike safety. Notice that no one has like a, like a helmet of sorts, and um, we wanted to, you know, talk about like the rules, like are there, and all that, you know, concussion that kind of thing. Um, and then the final thing is kind of like the background we wanted to highlight. Um, you know, kids, you know, talking about their neighborhood, like oh, we have a sidewalk, we have a um, and we have you know, paved roads, that kind of thing. Here, it looks like they have to play in the street. So, kind of like, do you play in the street all the time? Do you do that? Um, Great, thanks. All right, so how do you think we should end this morning? We talk more about how to use the photographs. Should we talk more about insights into the Middle East? Should we talk about how daunting it might be? Even think about global education? Something else? Sort of you know, in the schools and the system, that's far as seeing uh, social studies and science taking a strong seat to um, math and literacy, for example, mm -hmm. and, and that was ever more important to them to focus on different ways. And, and so it has so, um, I guess, the, the last point you mentioned, um, the daunting aspect of, of where do we fit this in and how do we differentiate for different neighborhoods, different populations, and all of these. How would we answer her concerns? Awaiting a coverage more math and science. Less focus on humanities, much less focus on science. And the testing. Pressure for that testing. How do we answer it for that? How do we answer these? Okay. Oh, I was just thinking, I don't know um, what's come up in your preparation questions mm -hmm. or in what you have heard, but um, sort of this focus on texting um, and scientific issues and that. So some science can be different than social studies, but um, mm -hmm. it can be lacking in the perfect school. Um, so math and literacy, the focus of that testing is sort of how we address um, that lacking. Um, I I asked, oh. I asked, 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 I
something like this card during the time that I've had mm -hmm. out it. Yeah. It's not something that's been for a long time. Right. And you could build up information or information about where this is going to come from. Um, I know in the discussion of the panel, they kind of just they put a lot more of it on the projects. And then they were then came to the class. So that was, I guess, the presentation aspect um, was when they did some social studies kind of world um, presentation in class. Um, I also feel like do things like um, the teachers are going to be still always slow in the Yeah. yeah, I had the exact same question and I started to think like, since there is such a focus on literacy, like how do we frame this as a literacy activity? And like, I can imagine there are so many cool connections where you can like make this a writing activity or, you know, like you're saying, like have readings. I think that's kind of where I want to, you know, kind of focus my attention with this is like trying it in that way more than like as an explicit social study. Suppose, Jessica. Suppose you wanted to do maps. Anybody at that proper place to start? Anybody else want to talk about math? Go ahead. Uh, well, not math, but I think um, there's always a way to integrate the history of math within, you know, you know, readings of kind of how math evolved from this area and bring it in. Um, there's always like, they teach us a lot of it, especially in the middle schools, you have team teaching among cross <coughs> disciplines and sort of having like a unit on, you know, maybe the math department kind of, you know, the unit is geometry, but you know, geometry used in other cities and then kind of bringing in kids ideas on not just figuring out the Pythagorean theorem and doing hundreds of problems but then bringing in like you know let's analyze the Pythagorean theorem can we put it into like the Golden State Bridge or you know something like that you know um, really you know highlighting the not just the straight content but more of the that you know exposure around the world and then um, highlighting like the standardized testing um, a lot of the times you know it's very you know the readings in there are boring, so you can't even bring in the kids, especially of, you know, like historical value. A lot of them are like, you know, in, for the SAT, for example, there's very little text on like African American history, for example, to grab in those kids who are in the Keystone. So um, there's like, you know, some liminal ways to maybe you know, have kids be reading nonfiction texts, but it doesn't have to be, you know, boring. They could be global scales. Yeah, um, also thinking about like science classes too. Um, so, like, I'm a physics teacher, but like, it could be really cool to use like the, like, the website with like the waters and talking about like beaches and like what is environmentally affecting like the water. Like, and how does that affect like your standard of living? And like, how does that affect us like, in cities or countries and like, like, like farms or whatever? And like, having those conversations about like what types of minerals are. What do you think you're most concerned about from the last round? Yeah. 
the school where I taught before Penn Charter has about 20% Jewish students who have very strong connections with the school. They would often, if family finances were available, would do their bar or black mitzvah in Jerusalem for television. Bringing up the Middle, the Middle East generally, what they really wanted to talk about was Israel. What they really didn't want to talk about was Palestine, or Saudi Arabia, or Yemen, or Lebanon. So that's exactly the kind of difficult topic which you can get yourself involved in without thinking you're, it's about coverage, right? And yet, in global history and global studies, there are many, many topics that can be really problematic. And back to one of your legal concerns about building competency, one is the understanding. Second one is actions. Whether or not those young people it is intended, are those young people supposed to become activists? And if they are, on um, what side should they become in? Yeah. Um, I've asked the question to yeah. the online students. Right. Right. Um, so one student put, um, getting getting this right. And so it's um, it's on the screen too. Um, so appropriate, relevant, contextual, and appropriate lexile information related to the global topic discussed for grade level um, that you're teaching. And I think, um, <clears throat> I don't know if they can speak on behalf of it, but I guess really like how can we discuss, you know, the water table to the second grader and make him understand that, like, you know, that kind of thing, if that's the, you know, how it's being right. phrased. You could always start with the school river mm -hmm. and the waterworks. Waterworks were created in the 19th century <laughs> and before, early on when the waterworks were originally created, the Lufkins got their potable water from the school. Now, a lot of it is available made that shift over, but you're imagining that the water conflict that would reach very far back in time and across the globe, that's one way to go. Another way is to literally look at pictures of the on the water and begin to ask questions about something right in front of you and then move into the sound mm -hmm. of perhaps a far more obscure kind of Well, 30. <laughs> I'm getting the rest of your Saturday back, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming this morning.